I am DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, I'm going to be coming, covering the boot process. I'm going to use Debian Linux because that's well understood, but I'm going to be taking this from the point of view of UEFI. Stay tuned right after this. The reason I'm, I guess the reason I'm doing this is I've got a number of uh, comments from users off of my Windows videos. Uh, and by the way, I'm I'm stuck on a problem, so I'm probably not going to finish that third step, that third the third phase this week. So um, I don't have to paint my hair different, four different colors, do I? I hope not. But uh, anyway, I wanted to. There was it seems to be some confusion about how UEFI works how the standard is and, is and how it's written and what you have to do in order to conform to that standard. So I want to take this from the point of view of a Debian system initialization. If you're on Fedora, you're on Arch, you're on Ubuntu, you're on Pop! OS, you're on some other operating system, it could be that your distribution has altered the way your particular boot works. And so it may be different from the way I'm going to describe Debian. And so, I mean, that's the nature of Linux and that's the world that we live in, right? 25 ways to do the same thing. <laughs> so I have a disclaimer. So the information that I'm going to present here today has been changing pretty rapidly over the past few years. Uh, in fact, it changes so fast that, I mean, I don't think even Texas weather can keep up with it. Um, so it's probably likely that this is going to be out, out of date by the time I publish this video. <laughs> but no, maybe not. But more likely, it'll be a few months to a year so. If you're looking at this video a couple of months or a year from now, look for an update to this uh, because this will be out of date. No, no question about it. So that's my disclaimer. Let's get started. Um, so what is UEFI? It is the, the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface. Oh, what the heck is that? And that is a specification that is controlled by the Unified Extensible Firmware Interface Forum. Whew, that's a lot of words. Uh, and they have a standard that they publish at HTTPS, UEFI.org. So you can go there and you can look at the standard at standards. that have, They keep a tree of all the evolution that's taken place, but they also publish documents that will give you an idea of, of this is a typical boot process. This is how things work. This is what you can expect. So basically... It includes a modern disk partitioning scheme known as GPT. And it doesn't matter if it's Windows or it's Linux or it's Mac OS. They all use GPT because that's part of the spec. Well, what is GPT? GPT stands for the GUID. It's an acronym within an acronym. I just love it. Uh, GUID partition table. So uh, in contrast, you have partition table types such as DOS, uh, you might have some that are uh, some of the older ones for Mac, I forget. But yeah, so anyway, the the GUID part of this means globally unique identifier. So it basically means that there's an identifier that uniquely identifies this particular partition table to your system. So UEFI, however, also understands the file allocation tables that are that are implemented. So at least for its needs. So remember, it's only going to get the UEFI firmware in your in your particular uh, machine. And this would we'll talk about some of the limitations, but it's going to look for the extensible system partition or ESP in order to know what's going to get done next. So what about legacy BIOS? versus UFI. What are the differences? And why did we change? What is up with that? So we've had the BIO stands for Basic Input Output System. We've had BIOS around in some form. It's evolved. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not on the same BIOS that we started with back in 1981. But the hard drive support in BIOS is limited to 2.2 terabytes per partition. Now, that doesn't mean that you have a limit of 2.2 terabytes for a hard drive. No, no. It means that you can only create partition sizes of up to 2.2 terabytes in size. 
So it has two modes, which are 16-bit and 32-bit. 16-bit is legacy. That goes all the way back to the beginning of time uh, for BIOS. And then 32-bit was added later. However, there's a couple of problems with BIOS that are big. First of all, there is no way to secure it. And we've had all kinds of root kits and all kinds of nasty things that have entered our systems over the past decades that have caught, you know, basically raised havoc on our systems. The other problem is, is if that MB, there's a, the limitations of the uh, partition size is, is, is painful. I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's just not good. There we have, sometimes we have partition sizes that we need larger than 2.2 terabytes today. So the originated the original one came out in the 1980s and then it was updated sometime after the first 32-bit uh, CPUs came around. So I don't remember what year that was. It's been a long time ago for me. But and it also doesn't support a mouse cursor. So you had to go use your arrow cursors to, to modify your configuration in your BIOS firmware. UEFI firmware uses GPT, which can theoretically support up to 9.4 zettabytes. Now, that's with 64-bit mode. However, it can run either in 32-bit or 64-bit mode, and I suppose the 32-bit was to offer some support for legacy. Uh, but it is a faster boot process, and it also offers secured boot features, which help prevent the system from being impacted by rootkits. Uh, in theory, in theory, and also the mouse cursor is supported. So let's talk a little bit more about that. The BIOS system used the master boot record and UEFI uses GPT. So what is the master boot record? What is MBR? So MBR supports, up as we said, 2.2 terabyte partitions, but it also limits us to four partition. Now I'm talking about primary, four primary partitions per disk. You can certainly create more partitions than that. However, you have to create them as extended partitions. Uh, you, and the other problem with MBR is there's only one copy of its data, and that data is pretty small. An MBR record is 512 bytes, I think, if I remember right. It's very, very small, and it's very limited as to what it can actually describe. Originally, the master boot record was originally just a, a disk sector that it pointed at to say, okay, OS, you're going to find the next stage of the boot here at this, this location on the drive platter. And it was for rotational drives. So, yeah, so it's changed a little bit. It's There's different data that's out there, but it's very limited on what it can actually describe. So if that data becomes corrupted, there's no place to recover it because that's the only place it exists. And now you have a system that can't find the next part of its boot cycle. And so it dies right there and it will fail to boot. There's, and again, the only way to fix it. Now there are some utilities that will go and attempt to repair an MBR today, but some of them, yeah, at some point or another, it may work, it may fail. I mean, you're, you're basically, how does your system know what to recover it with? It's guessing. Um, the GPT, however, supports up to a maximum of 128 partitions for both Linux and Windows. I'm not sure about Mac OS. I haven't really looked. I don't have an Intel-based Mac anymore to be able to go check that. So, yeah, they were just too old, so they're gone. Um, but there's multiple copies of that GPT data, The and what would be the equivalent of where to find the next phase in the boot process. So there's multiple copies of that that's stored on your desk. And so if in the event that that gets corrupted, uh, say you're in a dual boot uh, configuration with Windows on Linux, there are times when one of the operating systems can overwrite the boot record for the other one. So that happens and it can happen. Um, so, or your, your drives could have a failure at that particular location in the drive and the that particular area of maybe your SSD memory is no longer functioning, and so that data is now corrupt. But how does it know it's corrupt? It uses CRC, or cyclical data uh, redundancy checks, in order to determine if that data is intact or not. Now, CRC, of course, can't be used to recover the data. And so the system will look for the backup copies of the GPT tables in order to figure out, oh, uh, yeah, this is the copy location go load it from there. So, yeah. 
what about the ESP or the extensible the extensible system partition system partition? So you do have a system partition in um, UEFI systems, and that is an, an operating system independent partition. So it doesn't matter if you're running Linux or Mac OS or Windows, they all have to have one. In fact, if you go to the standard and you look it up, you'll find that ESP is mandatory. Absolutely, it's mandatory. So what's in there? Well, there's a bunch of stuff in there. There's where the bootloader is for your particular operating system. There is applications that may help to configure drivers or to launch drivers that are necessary in order to mount those portions of the file system where the next particular phase is going to retrieve that information from and start to load the next phase of the boot. So that's it. Uh, and then bootloader. You mentioned bootloader. What the heck is that? So on Linux, we've always, the bootloader is, is identifies where the kernel of the operating system is located. And for Linux, that typically is grub. Um, once that once grub is finished it's going to grub contains the location of your kernel uh, on the file system and we'll talk about the steps but its final thing that it's going to do is it's good, your kernel is going to call process id 1 and process id 1 for debian in debian's case is system d it can also be init d it could be rc init d depends on your distribution what they use. So let's talk about the steps. So in Debian, as it comes out of the box, there's four steps. And this is the default process. Yes, this can be modified. Uh, so I'm limiting this discussion to the AMD Intel 64-bit processors. ARM is completely different. They use, some of them use P-boot, some use U-boot, some use a direct access off of the hard drive to be able to, to load. So depends, <laughs> again, uh, so I don't want to I don't want to talk about ARM because it's different. Uh, you could compile your own kernel and you could eliminate stage three altogether if you want. So, yep. But in stage one, this is your firmware. So then at the point where we are in the system, your system is turned off. I hit the power button, and then the control from the power button passes on your motherboard to the firmware. And the UA5 firmware starts to execute reading its configuration out of NVRAM to determine what memory settings and what uh, device settings that you've configured, what settings for the firmware you've set up for security, what options you have turned on for virtualization, for example. All of those things are going to be set up. And then it's going to look for the USP. And the USP is where it's going to expect to find the bootloader. And your firmware at that point will pass control to the bootloader and it will be done. It's done with as far as the boot stage is concerned. At this point, uh, Grub will load in the stage two and Grub starts to execute. Now, you may see a display for Grub. You may not. Depends on how many options are in there and whether or not your Grub config file, grub.cfg, is set up to stop and wait based on a timer for you to choose an alternate operating system, ultimate steps that you may have in there. Maybe you put it into uh, a default mode where this, it, it only loads a, set, a, a subset of drivers in order to bring your system up safely to allow you to get to a command line and then make whatever changes on something that may be a driver or something that broke. So. At this point, Grub is going to pick which uh, file system contains your kernel image. And it's at this stage, it's going to load that into memory. And it's going to, it's a protected area of RAM that it's going to start your kernel. Now that is a stripped down kernel at this point. And and uh, yeah, and so there's many options for the bootloader, even within Grub uh, EFI, there are options even uh, on down that list. So there's two primary ones. There's a Grub EFI AMD 64. That's for uh, UEFI. There's Grub PC, which is for legacy BIOS. So if you look at your packages that you have installed, that will help you determine if you don't know which way your system is booting, you can see if you're running a legacy or a UEFI uh, firmware. So uh, once that 
once Grub has determined where the location of your kernel is, it passes control to that image and that image starts to execute. This is known as stage three, and that's the mini, also called the mini Debian system. Uh, and it's because this is basically a stripped down kernel. It only has enough brains or configuration in order to bring up the necessary drivers that it needs in order to find and load the main Debian kernel. This is done mainly for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, if you screw up the configuration on your main kernel, maybe you were, maybe you were compiling it, you wouldn't have any way to try to get back to a known release or have Grub load a particular version of the kernel so that you could then get to one that's working instead of the one that you have that's broken. So, that, and the other reason is there are device drivers that maybe are needed in order to get the main kernel up and mounted so that you can start to read it. So there are, there's always, there's always flowcharts in Linux. So uh, if it, if the init, this is called the init step, when it looks looks for the kernel, the init step, there's two forks. One is if it's built by init ram fs, it'll go down the process of loading the kernel into memory, the stripped down version. If it's done by Draycut, if I have configured my kernel with Draycut, it's going to skip that step and go directly to loading the kernel and then firing up system D directly. So yeah, it just depends on, on, on how you do it. You may also hear the stripped down kernel referred to as a busy box. Don't confuse that with busy box Linux. It's not, it's not, it's similar in idea, but I mean, this is basically configured by the folks at Debian. So Debian, this is their stripped down version of kernel. Uh, stage four. The, the, at this point, I now have my location of my normal Debian kernel. I've started that up. That kernel is then going to be loaded. It's going to execute. And it's eventually, after it starts doing all of its things and allocating memory and setting aside places for resources, it's going to go and look for the PID1 process on the file system or in Debian's case, the default is system D. It could be init D, it could be RC init D, it could be any number of, of uh, PID1 processes, but basically it's the rep responsibility of that process in order to construct the drivers, to get them the dev directory populated, to start to bring discovery into it, find out what uh, file system mounts are in your FS tab, for example. And then it's going to be looking for your services uh, application definitions, and then it'll start to execute services to get them up and running. Some of those are going to load in parallel on system D, and some are not. It just depends on how they're configured. Uh, and that point, uh, the systems that are is coming up. You're going to start. To, you'll start to get a login prompt. Your graphical user interface. Your screen will switch over into graphics mode if you're running a GUI. And at that point, then those drivers will get called and those applications will get called in order to log you into the system. Again, depending upon which GUI desktop interface, desktop environment you have running. Uh, so I'm going to leave system D for another time. I'm not going to cover that today, but uh, I do want to show you a couple things. So how do you hedge, how do you hedge your bet on kind of where things are. So the first thing I want to show you is I've, I'm going to, I've, I've run it, but I'll run it again. Let me, let me get my cursor back over here and we'll run a, a, an F disk. Now, if you try to do this with G disk, it, G disk, the L means something totally different. So uh, I don't know if G, I don't think G disk has the ability to do this. I wish it did, but it doesn't. So if you're wondering why I'm using an obsolete program, this is why is because it will actually show me my file system. So let me go down here to where I actually started. There's where I started. This first NVMe drive is uh, is my Linux drive, and you can tell because it has a Linux file system built on it. But you'll notice right here, the very first partition that was constructed on here is the EFI system partition, and that is the ESP. So that's the one you need. That's required. And that's where it's going to find... Uh, where to find, where to locate the grub loader in this case. And then you have my file systems that I have constructed. So these are for root, uh, home, temp, and also var. And then I have a swap file uh, partition as well. So not a swap file, but a swap partition. Now, Windows, 
This is Windows 11. This is the one I've been building off of for the series. So there's the identical EFI partition. They're not identical sizes, I don't think. No, they're not. So um, that's 100 meg, and on Linux, it's 512 meg. So they don't have to be the same size, but you do have to have an EFI system partition, and that is where Windows will find its bootloader. Um, and then these are the Windows partitions that were created. <laughs> I just love it. Look where the recovery partition is. It's stuck right behind the basic, basic data. So if you ever stick a larger, if you ever, <laughs> you can't move the recovery partition. Uh, so it's stuck right after your basic data instead of in front of it. So you can't ever expand your basic your uh, basic data partition. That's good. Good job, Microsoft. Good job. It's not their fault. They do everything by committee. And so it, it, the committee is the one that makes the decisions. So, yeah, bad decision there. Um, so so what I'd like to do is kind of show you some of the other things that you can do to find out what's going on with this system. So let's start with uh, the man pages on boot so that you can you can kind of see what where it's documented. So if you're using a Debian system that is older than Jesse, which is, Jesse is, I believe, where System D first came about into Debian because they were one of the longest holdouts against System D. But if you're on a, on a version of Debian prior to System D, then you can look here and it will show you the boot process that you need to follow for those older versions of Debian. So I wanted you to understand that. And then if you wanted to look at the, the Debian in distributions post Jesse, you can look at boot up and this will cover both uh, the uh, UEFI and uh, legacy BIOS. So it, as it says there, it'll, it'll talk about. And this goes into, and you, you'll see the, the chart, the structural chart here for <laughs> the boot up right it's quite it's quite detailed uh it'll give you all kinds of information about what's going on with your system um the the other thing you can do is like i had mentioned uh you can do a a a, a search for grub well, let's see let's go all the way back up here to the top and you'll start to see um, which ones are installed. Like on this one, I have the common, which are it's going to be the same no matter what. And you'll notice that Grub EFI AMD is installed. Also, the bin, those are would be some of the modules that are needed to go with that particular bootloader. Uh, and then there, <clears throat> there's some signed um, areas. And then, yeah, there's all kinds of things that, for EFI that you could add on to this, like if you were supporting older 32-bit ones. Um, then down here, Grub PC and Grub PC bin, this would be for BIOS, as it says. So you, this will give you some idea if you want to know if your system is, and you just don't know, if it's you're not sure, you can find out which, which part of the system it's using. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you can do is, um, if you want to be able to speed up your system, you can use System D Analyze to help you with that. And you'll notice here that it'll it'll tell me on my last boot that the startup took six seconds for firmware, three seconds for the loader, two point five for the kernel, ten point seven for the user space for a total of twenty two seconds. So, and then the graphical target was reached out in ten seconds after user space. So. Um, yeah, it gives you an idea that this is how long my system has taken up. Now, I don't know what processes they are, so I can run, if I do a help here, we can find out. So the default one I just ran is time. You can type that in if you want, but the default is time. And then and you can look at blame. Blame will give you a list of the running units ordered by the time to a net. So let me do, let me do that. And we'll put in blame. And this will give me a list of all the system processes that are running. Now, remember, these are the individual times for how long each of these services took. But remember, these are running in parallel. Some of these are running in parallel. So don't say, oh, it took 24 plus 7 plus no. 
You can't do that. You have to look at time to see the total time that it took, not based on this, because this is an additive. These are the individual time. So if you were going through this and you're going, hmm, I'm going to speed up my system. What services could I get rid of that might help me speed up the system uh, in order to get it up faster? And so it's booted faster. So, yeah, that's all I'm saying. Uh, you can also um, you can also plot this. Let's see. Let's do um, this. This will be blame dot. SVG, and then we'll need to, yeah, it's it's an eye chart. Sorry about that, but it is. We'll just we'll just zoom in a bit, and then I'll stretch this across so you can kind of see what we got. Now this one is going to give you a lot more information. So yeah, it, it this is going to give you a lot more detail, and I'll start up here. And it'll show how much time each of these take the, the took uh, graphically. Now I can, I think I can. Let's see. We can kind of scroll down through this, but you can see it puts a little graph across it. Like that's 133 milliseconds. Some of these don't take long at all. They're just defined. Def, like the UDEV is just looking for discovery. You know, there's. Yeah, all the UDEV services that are loading. So this will tell you which parts of those services are delaying you. And it trees in. There's the audit service. There's the network service. And we can probably, there's network manager, the firewall service. We'll just keep going on down. And yeah, you can use that to kind of zero in on what specific areas are affecting performance on the system. So, but it's a helpful utility to give you some idea of what's going on if you're trying to speed things up on your own. So uh, with that, I hope you enjoyed this uh, this look at uh, Debian system initialization steps and some of the things that you can look at to help you uh, understand better what's going on with your systems. And I hope you enjoyed this. And if you just remember one thing that uh, the developers for the kernel and the developers for the distro, they're always looking for ways to make things quicker for us because it makes them quicker for them too. So they're always looking for to do things. That's why this changes so quickly. And somebody will come up with, oh, let's do this. And they'll and they'll try it. And if it's faster, they'll put it in. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a good thing. I, we always want things to run faster. And, of course, the hardware gets faster along with it. I hope you enjoyed this today. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all next time in the next video. And if you haven't done so, please like or subscribe. And hope to see you again real soon. And bye for now.